Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm so glad that you have decided to join us online this morning. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I have been asked this morning to come and speak on my experience with Global Missions. Um, to start us off, I'm gonna ask that we all bow our heads and go ahead and pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to take time this morning to just focus on you and recenter ourselves. God, I pray that you will just be with us today as we hear and discuss your word and as we think and reflect on what it means to be um, and serve in missions and support missions as a church and a community. God, um, thank you for everything you have given us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So as I said, um, my name is Elizabeth and I was asked to come and speak this morning. When Marion asked me to um, talk, one of the phrases she gave me to kind of think about was, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And as I was kind of reflecting on what that means for me, I wanna take some time this morning to share with you about my experience with serving the Lord in a global mission capacity and then talk a little bit about what that might look like for all of you. So I grew up going to RUMC. I've been a member here for about 22 years, which was pretty much my whole entire life. Um, grew up going to Kid Zone and then spent time in the Dodd. And I graduated from Georgia Tech with a degree in environmental engineering with a focus in water systems, and then moved over to Sierra Leone, which is on the west coast of Africa, um, to work and serve in um, the global water crisis. So. My first experience with missions was actually um, with RUMC. When I was in high school over at the Dodd, they were talking about this trip to Kenya to go and see Divine Providence. And I decided, you know what, that would really be something that I would like to do. You know, I had traveled a lot, but I had never been to a place like Kenya, to a third world country where it was underdeveloped. And I really felt like it was a good opportunity for me to step into a serving position with Divine Providence and kind of go and visit and help them in any way that I could. And when we went on this trip, our spearhead verse that we kind of focused on was Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, which I think is going to sound familiar for a lot of you. It goes like this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, in theology and in the church, we refer to this as the Great Commission. It's God's great call to go and serve the Lord. And through my experience in Kenya, this verse really stuck with me. When I was able to be at Divine Providence and kind of see a different culture and a different world, it made me realize that life is a lot bigger than just me. And the world is a lot bigger than just my little bubble here in Roswell. And when I was coming off of that mission trip in Kenya, I think that there was a seed planted in me, um, a seed planted that 
drove me towards global missions, towards helping those internationally and towards helping people that are in a position where they don't even have their basic needs met. When I was um, in Kenya, that was the first time I'd ever seen a situation where people did not have clean water, they didn't have food, and every single day all they were doing was trying to survive. And it's hard to forget that image. So flash forward a little bit, like I said, I went to Georgia Tech and I got a degree in environmental engineering. I always knew that math and science were going to be the way that I was going to go. I feel that God has blessed me with those analytical capabilities and it was pretty much a straight shot to graduation with that degree for me. Um, but at the end, you know, I was a senior, everybody was talking about what they were going to do with their lives, where they were going to go. And for me, that seed that was planted in Kenya, it had grown a little bit. And I was having a really hard time figuring out how to reconcile the call and the great commission to share God's Bible, to spread it to all nations, while also using my engineering skills that I knew God had blessed me with as well. And I took time my senior year to pray and ask God for answers and figure out how I could make my engineering work into ministry work and my ministry work into my engineering work. And as I was thinking about this, an opportunity fell into my lap. We had um, a group of recruiters come to Georgia Tech and they came to my campus ministry. They were working with an organization called Ibero American Ministries, which is a missionary sending organization. And they were looking for somebody who could use their technical skills to work um, in a water sanitation system development company. So using their engineering degree to kind of improve capacity and build their system while also planting churches in the areas that they were doing that. And it was like in the moment that I was questioning what I could do most, this opportunity that was everything I wanted fell into my lap. And a lot of times we write those things off as coincidences. But when we write things off as coincidences, what we're really choosing to do is ignore how God is moving in our lives. And in that moment, I decided not to do that. I recognized that God had answered my prayer and that this was an opportunity that I needed to pursue. So I decided I'm gonna to move to Sierra Leone and after graduating from Georgia Tech in 2020, in the midst of COVID, a global pandemic, I moved to the west coast of Africa. So I wanna share with you a little bit about what I did there. Um, like I said before, I was focusing on water sanitation system development. We were partnered with a charity called Water4, and their whole goal is to address the global water crisis. Now, if you're not familiar with the global water crisis, I just wanna share some facts with you. 2.1 billion people lack access to clean drinking water. This leads to things like cholera and dysentery, other waterborne diseases, and people are constantly getting sick because of it. Not only are they sick because of the diseases that are carried in the water, but because they do not have water, they're not able to have san sanitized systems and sanitized places to live, which leads to the spread of other diseases. Now, a lot of these diseases are easily treatable, but they don't have access to any medical care. So what it means is that every single day, 4,000 children die because of their lack of access to safe drinking water. On top of this, it means that they have to usually fetch water, which means they have to walk miles and miles every day carrying buckets on their heads to get water. And 62% of this responsibility falls on women in Sub-Saharan Africa, which means there's less opportunity for them to go to school, less opportunity for them to get educated, and less opportunity for them to earn. When all they can do is spend their time fetching water to survive, they're not able to grow their capacity and grow their capabilities in any way, and they get stuck in the cycle of just trying to survive. If you want to learn more about this, I'd really encourage you to look it up because there's a lot of information on it and a lot of people that are trying to help and solve this problem. Now I want to talk about a different crisis that you may not be as familiar with, and that is the sustainability crisis, which is the one that I am extremely passionate about. Sustainability in charity, specifically in the water sanitation realm, is a huge issue. $1.2 billion of water infrastructure is sitting broken and unused in Africa. Most infrastructure that is put in place in these areas is non-functional after five years. And the reason is because people who are so well-intended and charities that are intending to help they're coming over and they're drilling wells, they're putting in infrastructure, and then they're leaving. And it works for a while, but then it breaks. A screw comes loose, maybe a specific parts needs replacing, and no one is there to fix it. 
Think about the things that you have that are expensive. A water well is very expensive. It takes maintenance. Just like your house, your car, and yourself have to be maintained responsibly, the same goes for the infrastructure that be, is being put in place in these villages. To put these things in place and then not build a way to maintain it is just lying to ourselves that we're solving the problem. Charity alone is not going to solve the water crisis. So how are we different? At Waterfort, we believe that charity is only effective when it's used to empower local people with the opportunity to solve their own problems in a local and sustainable way. The answer is not more complicated technologies, it's not fancy machines, it's investing in the people in the communities that are in need and finding a way to solve the problem using the resources that they have. At Water 4, we are not giving a man a meal, we are teaching him to fish. And we are doing so in a way that he will be able to do one day after we leave. We believe that God works through the capacity, strength, and greatness of ordinary people to eradicate the water crisis, leaving behind lasting peace and reconciliation in its place. We seek to imitate Jesus in the way that we are serving. If you look in the gospel stories, you see a lot of examples of Jesus calling people to preach and teach and serve. And we are aiming to do the same thing by calling up people in their own areas to lead and solve this problem. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not easy, it's not simple, and it's gonna take a very long time. We're talking 20, 50, 60 years of side-by-side -side discipleship to get these people to a place where they're able to store these resources. But it is possible, and it's the only way we are gonna solve the problem in a sustainable way. Now, while the global water crisis is a huge issue, it would be irresponsible of us to assume that people who have clean water are okay because you have to also think about their eternity. What good is clean water on earth if you do not have salvation for eternity? So we at Water 4 see physical water as the entry point to bringing the living water to those that are in need. In Sierra Leone, there was a lot of turmoil over the past 20 so years. They had a very bad civil war, then they were hit with Ebola. And so there's not a lot of friendliness to outsiders just because no one is very inviting. And so when you go into a village and you want to introduce yourself, if you were to walk up and say, I have the Bible and I want to tell you about it, you are not going to get a lot of enthusiasm from those that you're talking to. So we use drilling wells and creating sanitation systems as an opportunity to build relationships with the people in the area so that we can then teach them about Jesus and plant churches. We have a well drilling team that works side by side with a discipleship team and together they go into communities and get to know people so that they can plant churches, build disciples and things of that nature. We are focused on the long term, which includes water services and discipleship that can multiply for generations. I wanna share with you a story of somebody who worked with me, his name was Muhammad, and I think his story really demonstrates well both of these things that we're focusing on in our business. Muhammad started out with us in our business in Sierra Leone as the janitor. So he came in after hours and he swept the floor and he mopped. And he did not have any formal education. He graduated from the Sierra Leone High School but wasn't able to go to university. And so this was pretty much the only job that he was able to find. And we recognized that when he was coming in, he was always asking questions about what we were doing, about our mission. And he was asking the Sierra Leoneans that work there about their experience at Water Forever, um, which is the branch in Sierra Leone of Water For. So, we recognized his initiative and we decided to hire him on as um, a me mechanic. So he worked as a mechanic. And then he moved up into our shop where he was able to help us produce our wells and our steel buildings that we use. And what he was doing was asking questions and asking questions and he wanted to learn. And we recognized that in Muhammad, despite his lack of education and despite his lack of resources, he was eager and he was ready to learn. And so we jumped onto that and we trained him up until he is now managing our whole entire production sector. So we create these kiosks and Muhammad is the one who manages all of that. And then when our capacity got too high, we decided that we needed a bigger machine. We needed this, it's basically a steel work machine where you can cut steel out. It involves coding. It's very complicated and I don't even know how to use it. But Muhammad does. 
He went in the span of four years from being an uneducated janitor mopping floors to managing a staff of 15 people. And he is now a key part of our enterprise and a key reason that we are able to provide clean water to those in need. Not only that, but throughout this process, we were able to witness Muhammad and share with him about Jesus. We are focused on the villages that we are working in, but we're also focused on our staff that are working in our enterprises and we do Bible studies. Muhammad was a Muslim along with 75% of Sierra Leone, but during his time at Water Forever, he kind of came around to the Bible studies. He started listening, then he started asking questions, and eventually he recognized the power of Jesus and the power of, of Jesus' salvation for us. So by intentionally developing Muhammad into a leader, we have also been able to share with him the power of Jesus, and we're able to do that in a lot of ways. And now Muhammad is also doing the same thing with his employees. And it's a ripple effect where we're creating disciples who can create disciples just like they're doing a divine providence in Kenya by training up people who can go and create their own disciples to continue sharing the gospel of Jesus. In my time in Sierra Leone, I focused a lot on training Sierra Leoneans on water quality. So I was able to train 55 Sierra Leoneans and get them lab certified on how to test for various different um, pollutions such as arsenic, pH, all the things that you need to know about in water quality. We had 27 different baptisms while I was there, 15 new discipleship groups, 122 new access points. And all of this was possible because of people like you who are willing to support our church's global ministry and global missions because it's not possible without a whole entire village to back you up in it. So I've shared with you a little bit about what, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord looks like for me, but now I wanna talk about what it might look like for you. I think this circles back to the Great Commission of going and making disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Another part of it I think that's important is the Great Commandment, which I'm sure you're also familiar with, which is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And I know what you may be thinking when you hear that, make disciples of all nations. It's a little bit intimidating. You might think, you know, I think I'm just gonna focus on my nation. Or maybe I'm too busy, or maybe you know, I, have, I have my kids to worry about, I have my sick parents to worry about, I have my husband to worry about, I have my job worried about. You can make reasons all day. And I think the reason why we feel like we need to sometimes make excuses is because we make this more complicated than it is. This call to serve in a capacity to share the gospel is meant for not just select individuals, but for everybody who feels they have been called to follow Christ. We are called to be witnesses and ambassadors, enabling people to share the good word of Jesus and also sharing it ourselves. Now, global mission work is not about traveling to different parts of the world and preaching the gospel. And I don't want you to misunderstand me because that is a very important part of it and that needs to continue growing and the church is doing such a good job of storting that. But I'm not gonna stand here and try and convince you all to move to Sierra Leone because I know we're not all in the same place. We put so much pressure on ourselves to make decisions like this. But I think at the end of the day, what the Great Commission and what the Great Commandment boil down to is simply carrying his name. Carrying Jesus' name to people who don't know it everywhere we go, and doing so in a way that is sacrificial with our time and with our finances. As long as we prioritize, as long as we prioritize carrying Jesus's name and enabling others to do the same, then we are fulfilling the great commandment. Whether we are doing so in a nursing home, in an office, in our families, in Sierra Leone, in Chile, it doesn't matter. What God wants us to do is simply take Jesus to people who do not have access to him and help others do the same. Just because you are not moving overseas to be a missionary does not mean you are not a critical part of the church's global missions. Missionaries like myself, we cannot do what we do without the support of all of you. They say, you know, they say it takes a village. And for me going to Sierra Leone, it really did. And I wanna share with you a little bit about my village so that you can see the ways that I have been impacted throughout my whole entire life. I think 
when I look back to where it all started, it's just getting involved in the church as a child, which means that every single person that volunteered in Roswell Kids, or when I was there, it was Kids Zone. Every person who volunteered at Kids Zone and was a Sunday school teacher. The people who stood on the stage in funny outfits and danced every Sunday. People who prayed for our, our children in our church. They contributed to my decision to move to Sierra Leone. Everyone who served and volunteered at the Dodd. Once I got out of Kid Zone and I moved to the Dodd, there was constantly people that were pouring into me, people that were trying to show me that Jesus should be the priority of my life and that I should focus on him and accept him as my savior. And, and by having those people pour into me, I was really able to recognize that this was something I was passionate about. Every person who led a D group, when I went to AYL, every single host home that I stayed at, every single event that was put on at the Dodd required an army of people to make it happen. Volunteers who came for one hour, volunteers who gave a whole weekend. But I think that every single one of those people contributed to my decision to be a global missionary. My co-D group leaders, I was a D group leader, leader in the Dodd for several years when I was in college before I moved to Sierra Leone and my co-D group leaders poured into me and they were a huge part of the decision. My parents for being supportive and letting their daughter move to an unsafe area in Africa and accepting it and supporting it. And most importantly, those who prayed for me as I was making this decision and every single person who donated to me, I had to fundraise to be in Sierra Leone and serve there for two years and it took a lot of people to get me to the point where I was able to move over there. And every single one of those people throughout my whole entire life contributed to the reason why, why I am a missionary. And so I think sometimes we think, oh, I'm not contributing to global missions. But if you are giving financially to the church, then you are. If you are volunteering and serving at the Dodd, then you are. If you are teaching Sunday school, then you are. Every single one of you that is contributing to our church is contributing to growing up leaders who will have planted the seed to go out and be global missionaries. So today I encourage you to consider how you can be involved in mission work. What do you have access of? Perhaps it's time, maybe it's energy, maybe it's your finances. And I want to encourage you to give those things, but not to do so in a way that's comfortable. God calls us to do so in a way that is uncomfortable, in a way that almost feels impossible. But impossible is where God begins to really start doing his best work. When we trust him fully with the things, when we give him our resources and we say, God, I'm not really sure if I can do this, but I'm trusting you, that is where God gives us the greatest returns. Let's say you have some extra time and energy. Volunteer. There's a lot of opportunities to volunteer within the church, but also with our local mission partners. I would encourage you to use your time and energy to do those things. Maybe you can't volunteer with the church, but there are people in your office, there are people in your life who might not really know Jesus. Start a Bible study at your work during lunch. Invite people to review the book of Matthew. Talk to your neighbors when you see them on their porch. Just share with them what you heard this Sunday at church. Let's say that you have extra money. Consider increasing your tithing to global missions. It is a huge, huge realm that is growing and I think people are beginning to recognize how many parts of the world are unreached and I would encourage you if you're not already tithing in a way that is sacrificial to do so, whether it be in a one time or a recurring donation because I know from my experience with RUMC and their mission division, they store their finances very well. I know for me, the money that RUMC gave made a huge difference in my mission work and I know that it's doing so for people like Mary Stevens who's working in Chile, for people at divine providence and for our missionaries that are serving all over the world. And maybe you're hearing this and you're saying, Elizabeth, I don't have anything left to give. You know, for whatever the reason, I don't have finances, I don't have time, I don't have energy. I'd ask that you pray because we see so often in the gospel, the power of prayer. And if you don't have anything else to give, I would encourage you to just devote yourself to praying for all of our mission partners here at RUMC. If you look online, you can get a list. Maybe every morning, wake up and pray for one of those people, for one of those organizations, for their success 
and, and just pray for them to continue feeling encouragement because mission work can be really hard. And your prayers, they do make a difference. And I want all of you to know that when you take the time to pray and support, you really are making a difference. I want to thank you for being here and for listening today. And I just wanna encourage you to remember that even the small ways that you are serving are creating a ripple effect that make a huge difference. When you throw a stone into a lake and you watch the ripples that have to happen afterwards, oftentimes you get too bored and you turn around and you don't see the rest of the ripple. Here at RUMC, the mission work that we are doing is like throwing a stone. And I think it's important for us to watch the ripple and watch it go all the way to the edge of the lake and then recognize that for every stone that we throw and for every disciple that we make, they are throwing their own stone and the ripples are endless. But it, it means we have to do so intentionally to keep doing it. I'd encourage you to reflect on this and reflect on the ways that you can continue serving the church in its mission capacity and steward what you have been given in a way that will make God proud. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for today. Thank you for what you have given us for all of our resources. God, I pray that you will help us make decisions to store those things responsibly, Lord. I pray that in the times where we can get distracted with work and with life, God, that you will just remind us of the Great Commission and remind us of the Great Commandment to love you and love our neighbors above our else, God, and to share your word and your salvation with those who do not have it, Lord. I pray that in the moments that that feels intimidating, God, that you will give us strength, that we will be okay with a little bit of discomfort for the potential of someone's salvation, God. And I just pray that for everybody here, that they will just recognize that even in the smallest ways, they have contributed to our church's global mission and ministry, God. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and bless us as we go this Sunday. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.